and accidents and stuff. Let me look this shit up. Donut Media. Are they, um, are they chuds? They kind of look like it a little bit, but I don't want them to let Will spray paint the car for you. Nah, just funny car dudes. Have a look at this, how the media fueled the riots in Australia over Muslim and Arab racism. What? No, dude, I don't want to watch that. What the fuck? They're liberals with leftist tendencies? Wait, really? Not chose, just cringe? I just followed them. Oh, well, Gus, Gus did a video with them. I'm going to DM him right now and be like, yo, hook me up with Donut Media. Go to West Coast Customs. Okay, let's finish this Part video. Part of his and then final we'll look video, at a tribute to himself with clips of him playing and sad so, music. So, a guy in it's interesting to consider why exactly Randy targeted the supermarket. In his journal entries, he talked about how targeting the supermarket would be lame. But for some reason, he did it anyway. As it turns out, Randy said in one of his videos that his father was a manager there, and the two weren't exactly getting along. Once I started having lousy grades and applying for jobs, and it just, I hated him. Didn't even want to look at him. And then all he seemed to care about was, like, me getting a full-time job and making money and then trying to move out of the house and start my own life and all this shit, which I knew I never I was never gonna do prime example of people I hate in this world prime example of someone who could be nice and happy and easy going and joking one day to you better straighten out your life the next I thought I could be bipolar too but good lord Ooh, I hate my profession I want to quit find another job that's what you tell me to do you hated your job for years what'd you do you took it out on your family way to go that's definitely the answer to all your problems, isn't it? You hear that? That's me clapping and applauding from the heavens above. When's the last time you ever said you were proud of me? When's the last time you ever said I love you? And I'll tell you one thing, back in elementary school, middle school, I used to worry about dad dying the most out of anyone in this house, because I loved him back then. Once high school took off and college and all that, I, I found it impossible to love him anymore. And I just started hating guys more than anything. Something I tracked down which gave me a new insight beyond what you might find about the Weiss Market shooting was Randy's autopsy report. In addition to the gruesome details of his death, the autopsy revealed a couple of really interesting things. And as I go through what I found, the details will only get more intriguing. There's no blood, right? <clears throat> Reading the autopsy report, I found out that Randy was wearing black makeup at the time of his death. The report says that it was on his lips and in orbit patterns, which made me think that he had drawn his makeup to look like the swirls that Ember from Danny Phantom wears around her eyes. When his body was found, he apparently had women's clothing on underneath. I'm losing my mind, dude. The narrator is like actually horny. It's so weird. <sighs> Wanted to look like Ember. Oh. Neath his regular clothing. And here's the most interesting find. Randy had 372 milliliters of diphenhydramine in his system when he died. For those of you who don't know, diphenhydramine is Benadryl, and you should never take more than the recommended amount as it can be fatal. But Randy had ingested way over the maximum that anyone should ever take. As soon as I saw this, I realized something. Randy would have been essentially suffering from an overdose that night. His vision would have been blurred, he could have felt really confused, unsteady, or drowsy, and most startlingly, he could have been suffering from seizures and hallucinations as well. I can only speculate about why Randy may have chosen to take this much of something that would harm him, but I think it's interesting to consider that he could have been seeing or hearing things that night. 
Of course, he had been planning this attack for a long time, and any hallucinations may not have affected what he did. But another really interesting element of this whole thing is Randy's own comments about drugs. In his own tapes, he talks about how he isn't interested in drugs. So why did he take a harmful amount of Benadryl that night? Was it to ensure that he didn't back out of his plan? Some people have speculated that he may have been hallucinating the animated character Ember. In a 2018 interview, Kristen came forward to speak on her experience, and she emphasized that Randy was suffering from a mental illness, and that the man who carried out these evil acts wasn't the person she and her co-workers knew and loved. This was someone different. After speaking with other employees, she says everyone agreed on one thing. They never saw this coming. And maybe that's the scariest part about this whole story. Whether it was a slow, inevitable buildup or a sudden snap, nobody could see the hidden demons just below the surface of Randy's quiet and unassuming demeanor until it was much too late. Although nothing can reverse this awful tragedy, perhaps it can serve as a lesson of the kinds of warning signs that may be able to alert us that someone is a danger to themselves and potentially everyone around them too. All right, that's it. I'm tweeting at Donut Media. I said, yo, Donut Media, would you like the soup of a 2011 V6 Toyota Camry leather? Toyota Camry Sports Edition for a video? Not to flex, but it has leather heated seats. Okay, there you go. Blasted chat. I know I said not to flex, but I intended to flex. Like, I, I totally was flexing. I think they're going to be very impressed when they find out that, yeah. They, these guys probably have never seen a sick car like that, so. This was an interesting video. Okay, let's watch these guys. Why communists suck the making wants cars? To buy a car. He goes to the dealership. The dealer's like, hey, so you know there's a 10-year waiting list on these things, right? Like, all right, that's fine. And he puts some money down to buy it. Uh, just before he leaves, he asks the dealer, hey, uh, should I pick this car up in the morning or afternoon? It's 10 years away. What does it matter? He's like, well, the plumber's coming in the morning. We're used to competition. Every company wants to capitalize on the newest, fastest, and safest technology in order to appeal to us the consumer for the record uh, the people that were making fun of me for spelling souped up with a instead of a s-u-p-e uh spelling it as though it is a s-o-u-p i i said it in the right way i i'm right that's the correct way to spell that it's what drives innovation after all. But what happens when that's not the case? When a communist state owns all the companies? Is innovation stifled? Today we're going to talk about some of the most interesting cars to come out of the USSR and what it was like to get your hands on one. Okay, he's not wrong that like the cars were dog shit. Um, I don't even know what the real reason is, but I wonder if he's just going to say that it's like it's not though lol you really telling me that fucking ussr era vehicles were good like they they're not but the irony of course is that like american vehicles at the same time were also dog shit and yet, we rarely ever think about that. Like, American vehicles are still dog shit for the most part. From 1922 to 1990, the United Soviet Socialist Republic, or Soviet Union, was a communist state that spanned 8.6 million square miles across Northern Asia and Eastern Europe. The USSR was thick. One of the first companies to be nationalized and start production of a purely Soviet vehicle under the USSR's watchful eye was AMO, otherwise known as Avtomobilnoy Moskovskoy Obshkivshestvo. <laughs> We're keeping that in. 
<laughs> the Moscow factory was the site of a stirring speech by Vladimir Lenin in which he promised the sons and daughters of the revolution that Russia would now step into the motor age. Engineers from the Scientific Automobile and Motor Institute working for AMO debuted the NAMI-1 in 1927. The first original Soviet passenger car, this rolling monument to the proletariat, was designed to combine the simplicity and low cost of a cycle car with the passenger capacity and comfort of a small car. It was considered an engineering success and did great on undeveloped roads, but ultimately failed because of its high production cost. Only a few thousand of them were manufactured between 1927 and 1931. For the next 20 years, the majority of vehicle production was focused on trucks and other military vehicles out of three plants, the Gorky Automotive Plant, or GAZ, the AMO Plant in Moscow, ZIL, and the Yavaslavi Motor Plant, or YAMS, YAMS. <laughs> Manufacturing of all-wheel drive trucks continued through World War II. All in all, 417,000 heavy trucks were produced. In Soviet Russia, car designs you! Many so- Oh my god, that's so bad, dude. Ah, uh, that's so cheese. Okay, look, it's 2018, they were- Soviet car models were basically just communist copies of- Look at the video's comment section, nice music you have there. All of the people are equal, but some are more equal than others. As a Russian, I've never been that offended with something I completely agree with. Hi guys, I'm from Latvia. Before 1991, we were a part of USSR. My grandpa got a car after 12 years of waiting in line. When I was 10, he taught me how to drive. It was his beloved Lada Waz 21076. It's a light four-cylinder, 1.6 liter, 75 horsepower, rear-wheel drive, five-speed manual car. That was simply amazing. Oh my god, the field of those cars is insanely cool. I got it as my first car at age 20, when I got my driver's license. I still have the car as my second car. Great cars, but anything above 120 kilometers per hour is really scary. You really feel the speed in that thing and brake are horrible. cars sold in other parts of the world the fucking volkswagen gti freak is in the chat again bro you should really check out the volkswagen gti you'd love it man it's reliable fast as fun and is efficient you'd love it dude no dude i'm not i'm not gonna try the cars it. mechanics will be simplified and the brakes and suspension beefed up to survive harsh soviet roads miss vixen cat like calling Fiat, you what Ford, is and opal would get soviet makeovers and would be rebranded and sold under different names the first Soviet compact car was no exception. The KIM-10 was based off a British Ford oh, model, fuck. the Prefect. Scientists from NAMI, fuck the same up, group dude. that developed the NAMI-1, reverse engineered the Prefect and converted the resulting drawings into the metric system so they could be adopted to Soviet materials and production techniques. The dinky little four-cylinder had a three-speed transmission and produced 30 horsepower. But surprisingly, the KIM- Volkswagen is a Nazi brand. You will get memes into oblivion for buying a Nazi car. So is Mercedes, but they make fucking epic cars, dude. I had a Jetta. I had a Jetta for a very long time. Incredible car. They make great cars, dude. Uh, German, German cars are very good. Also, you know, Henry Ford was a sympathizer of fascists, so we all have our problems. Who wasn't a Nazi back then, huh? Out of all of the titans of industry. Point me to a, point me to a titan of industry that didn't think like, you know, fascism could be a good solution to this communism bullshit. AM's performance wasn't that much different than its British counterpart, and apparently it was actually pretty good for the time, light years ahead of any other car being built in the USSR. 
Post-war USSR saw a massive expansion into the automotive sector. Moskvich, meaning native of Moscow, acquired the entire Opel manufacturing plant in Germany after the Nazi regime fell. The factory, located in the city of Rüsselheim, was a part of the post-war reparations paid out to the USSR by Germany. In 1947, they rolled out the Moskvich 400, modeled after the Opel Cadet. Soviet soldiers captured- Like, I hate to admit it, but the old uh, Nazi Mercedes is or, or are they Mercedeses? Like the G wagon is literally a, a Nazi vehicle, but the old like, what's the car that Hitler had? Like it's insane. The the Mercedes Benz Type uh, Six Thirty. Look at this shit. Like, it actually looks sick. My 99 Civic is still going strong. Ford made one third of the Luftwaffe motor pool. Wait, really? The G-Wagon is literally not a Nazi vehicle? How? Oh, because it was a military vehicle uh, made in, uh, for the Shah of Iran. And it's like, it, it's after... The, uh, it's after Nazi, but I thought Nazis did have a G-Wagon. There was like a different G-Wagon. It's not the same one. It's made in 19... The G-Wagon that we know now, it came out in 1979. But the, the predecessor of the G-Wagon is literally a, like a Nazi carrier, basically, which was, I think, the G4... Now I said the Volkswagen Beetle. Gelandewagen. The 1948, the G-Wagon's large adult father after World War II. Okay, this... No, there is a G-Wagon before uh, that G-Wagon. No, that's not what I'm talking. Oh, th yes, this is it. Yes. Mercedes-Benz W31 Type G4 was a German three-axle off-road vehicle. It was like a, it's like a, like a Nazi Hummer. As the uh, chatter uh, pointed out. That's not at all the same thing. Unlocked by a car. That's one of my CP bio partners. Dad has cigar burns on the dashboard. It looks like it. What? The G4, which was made in the late 20s to the late 40s, is the spiritual predecessor to the G-Wagon. Exactly. The G-Wagon now is for me wagging this dick in your face. Good one. Stooping to the lowest of lows, getting stunlocked by Nazi cussy. ...few opals and brought them back to the motherland. They carefully reverse engineered every component on the car, then built their own version of it in Moscow. The Moskvich 400 had a 1.1 liter inline four and came in a sedan. Okay, this is boring.
not really like that into cars, you know what I mean? So let's see what do they have like funny shit? Rich white owner of some company taking advantage of workers usually end up liking Nazi ideas. Yeah, no shit. RIP GT4586 Ferraris powered Toyota Drifts. Two grannies, one Lamborghini. $3,500 single turbo kit versus $8,100 twin turbo kit. We parked the race car at an expired meter prank. Fast driver, slow car, slow driver, fast car. How police cars got fast. How the American police cars changed everything. I thought you guys said these guys love Toyotas. Oh, the Supra. They're a car guy channel. I don't sure that I don't, I'm not sure if there's anything, uh, guy makes funny cars. B day. 1901 what the Cummins Mustang is dope what the fuck we made progress on a 4x4 off-road Hellcat we got twin turbos for a police car okay I feel like this guy's definitely a chud the 4x4 Lincoln this is a have you this is a staple what this guy has the stapler in what is known as gambler uh, rallies, I think it's called. God, I know so much about this shit because of Marat. Where the gambler 500 will they'll, they'll purchase like a really cheap $500, like a really cheap fucking car like this and kit it out and see if they can finish it. This guy is the Hoggers Marat. Marat is the Hoggers Marat. Walk to greatness. The brakes don't work. I'm on the trail. My head. I need to work on the brakes on this thing. Oh my. Pretty cool though. God. Oh. On the bright side though, look at the headliners gonna wake it up. <laughs> so uh that's the first thing we need to fix the brakes because hey, this guy literally looks like fatter Marat. Like everything about this is Marat. Why does every car guy look the same, dude? You mean the gumball five hundred mostly rich car owners completing a cross country race? No, dude, the gambler five hundred is not the gumball. They are literally on the opposite ends of the racing spectrum. Why do you feel the need to correct me? When the gumball is not the 500, I think it's a 5,000 anyway. Or 3,000? Here, I'll just show it to you. I don't know why I'm fucking not. Here, this is what I'm talking about. The Gambler 500 rally is a mostly off-road rally style navigational adventure using cheap and practical fun vehicles to run through the country and pick up trash, remove abandoned vehicles and boats. Participants are encouraged to spend no more than $500 on a vehicle. However, the limit is not enforced. Vehicles can be modified with no cap. Why do you remember all this shit? Um, because I have a really bad brain. And it only fits like dumb shit that I will literally never use.
for anything good. I have a bad brain. And also because I listen to Murat when he speaks. And he doesn't shut the fuck up about cars and rallies. And like literally there's all he loves. So after a while through osmosis, I've like learned shit about cars and stuff. Even if I don't want to, you know what I mean? Like a four door that drives like a two door. Murat's not here right now. Anyway, I don't want to, I don't care about, I don't want to watch the cult of David Dobrik. Are you still all alone at the house? What the fuck? What are you going to come murder me, dude? Holy shit. No, I think I'm, I think I'm done for today, dude. I'm gonna go hang out with my brother. Okay. Uh, we already did okay, buddy. We did all of it. Uh, I am gonna have a PO box tomorrow, most likely. I'm just letting you guys know. The real reason you're watching this is because of my first is a 4x4 Lincoln. Okay, good for you, man. Here's the last three minute ad break here of the day, okay? Uh. And then. Sorry. Just burped. But, uh, I will see you guys tomorrow. Why do you say XQC raid? That's funny. I think I'm going to, I know who I'm going to raid. I'm raiding a legend. Okay. We'll watch the new channel five tomorrow. Okay. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed your stay. Fuck, my raid is not coming up on my end. Oh, there it is. All right, love you guys. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. We'll do the P.O. box and we'll figure some other stuff out, okay? Bye now.